when you click on that, it, uh, it would be nice to have like a little feed that says, okay, new update, and then feedback from the, the organizing team where we're saying, oh, this is cool, we're gonna actually accept it as a workable part in the design. Uh, and it could be a small part. So you can reward ongoing contributions uh, by setting up, up as, as a modular thing where, okay, I found actually the best bolt and the best sourcing for this uh, 3D printer. Like we get them from McMaster Car. Maybe somebody found a, another source that's better. So they upload that, they get credit, because we know, hey, that's already better than what we have. We're going to give you a point for that. And even though it's such a tiny part, it still contributes because the, the whole project is made of uh, a million tiny parts. So, so it's a lot of uh, management issue, but the computer infrastructure can get you that a lot, like the FreeCAD. Um, access to FreeCAD is a, is a very much accessible tool. The fact that you can upload things readily to the wiki and log things. Uh, that makes it accessible, so lowering the barriers to entry. So that, that's about it for the, the idea. But the concept is with the design jams, I mean, there's so many things, like people don't really think about it this way, but like, okay, they're like, typically it's like, okay, where do we start? But as long as people get this idea that, okay, there is so many things we can do, and here's procedure, procedures of how we do them, you can get massive collaboration. Nobody's really doing this that I know of, in any kind of a concerted uh, group project way. So this is definitely pushing the boundaries of what exists. This has been well developed in software. All the major software projects are doing that seamlessly, but it's, but it's software. And I'll, I guess I'll end off with, uh, Eric? Well, uh, go ahead. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk about um, kind of two related topics. Um, so like, when does benchmarking come into this? Like, uh, so to be able to have people work yeah. together, they have to build something um, together. Yeah. Uh, that is very easy in digital space. Um, so how do we benchmark? And yeah. then um, kind of related. So with the iteration, we have to, um, you know, you, you learn some creative process. So where? Or how do you go about doing the learning? Yeah. Right. How does, yeah. Um, there's a lot of dynamic stuff. There's a lot of, it's a big, hairy hairball here. Yeah, I just want to so, I, can, I think I can answer the first one. The benchmarking is in our first step of studying of the industry standards. So we have a, the, the key is that you have to understand what that entails. So on our wiki, somewhere we have, uh, you can type in study of industry standards, and uh, I'll actually go to, let me show you where that is. So. It's called development template. The development template has a lot of the stuff I described is already contained in the development template, which is, so here, here's a basic video of how you do that. And, and a lot of what I just talked to you about is captured in those very basic steps. Now the cool thing is for every, so that's, you know, watch that video. How does, this talks about how to start new projects on the wiki because the key is documentation. How do you keep track of everything? thousands of pieces. So the development template is very simple. It's like 40 elements or a shorter version one of 40. So item number two, industry standards. Well, everyone has to have a common language of what that is to be most effective. So you click on it and we try to define it what that is and a lot of these may need updating, but each one is hyperlinked to the instruction set for that step. And that's a big point. So analysis of industry standards protocol. How do you do it? Introduction, like what the, what is that about? So you know you study the history, the prior art, like patents and everything. Here's the protocol, uh, crowd protocol. So basic steps. All these pages need updating. That some of the stuff we want to develop as a team because we all want to get together on defining something that we all like <laughs> and say, okay, we can stand for this. This is an effective process. We can get others involved and we can document it effectively. So yeah. that sets a benchmark. Um, so we can to benchmark shoot, to shoot. Um, but for example, uh, the E3D, we do have a development template yeah. for that. So where would we um, work together to build uh, the manuals and the um, public stuff? Okay. So that, so that could be three, three items to that. First of all, if you're building this last version, that's going to be its own development template. It's not going to be 17.07. It's going to be that one. 
So one one aspect of okay, where do you document it? One one part is if we go if we go to um, build instructions is one. That's just basic build instructions, but you want a little more than that. We'd like to have full product manuals, which include instructions, operations, safety, maintenance, and cat files, all of that. That would go more into, so this template, that's just the first page. Now you got a bunch of other tabs, which is, one is enterprise. Let me see if I can get that sharper. There's different other tabs. So one is dedicated to enterprise. There should be another one here that's more like it's not it's not all in place, but there should be like the documentation part is part like build instructions, build pictures, video, data collection. A lot of that a lot of these elements here, in fact, like a lot of this can go into the product manual. And that sh there should really be another next major one, which is not development, but documentation. So that could be like publishing. Like here's your design guide. Here's your product manual. Here's maybe like your, uh, your marketing copy for announcing a workshop. That's publications, which would also go into more like into enterprise. So what the point is, you can break the project down into like so many different things, but, you, but the main things are, there's development, there's documentation, there's enterprise, you can go into others. Um, so not super clearly defined, but if you were to do it, the easiest thing is we all keep logs on the wiki. Uh, the way the, the core team works is like, okay, say somebody's working on a design manual, well, first of all, just, just declare it, okay, uh, 3D printer uh, build manual, just start it because you can always edit the wiki afterwards. You can redirect, rename pages, and so forth. We can put, like, if that's our official guide, we probably want to then put it on our front page of the wiki and stuff like that. So we can manage that as, as we go along. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around. Um, so if um, people are all setting up their own pages, that's going to be hard to exchange the feedback back and forth. And build yeah. Up. yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to lose information along the way. Yeah. And people want to keep track of their own things. Um, so, what do you think there should be like a, a major version and then personal versions? Or um, how, how do we go about towards that? Yeah, that's what you're talking about is indexing and featuring. So, we don't have, I mean, you can't create all that functionality within uh, the wiki like featuring things or doing a platform like, for example, Open Builds has a bunch of individual projects. But there is, within our formalism here, there's like the main trunk and different versions. Where we keep it is this gets into taxonomy, but we keep it for any project, you have a genealogy. So you can put all the, all the versions there. So if you're savvy about how the development process works, you're going to go to project name, Genealogy. Let's test it. So, so 3D printer genealogy. I just want to point out that you have we have individual logs for the yeah. developers on I, the wiki I, I, too. I've been yeah. logging on okay. building cool. projects and such. I mean, I'm trying to get. Yeah, I mean, some. yeah, it's a complex thing. It, it's uh, like on GitHub, GitHub uh, genealogy. So, for example, how does a group like this go about building a manual? That's um, a bench benchmark or something that um, is improved upon um, as, a, as a thing to show that multiple people. Yeah, we have to agree how to do it. So first, we would say, okay, we're going to all start a Google Doc doing this, and we can we can we can do that. And we say, okay, so I I would for example put on my log. Other people are contributing, they could probably put it on their log. So then it would go to the main, for example, this, the main page for that project. Like we have, if you go just to 3D printer, you'll probably get the old, like, from way, you know. So this is like all the latest versions. We got like, you know, 10 or 12 or whatever. But what happens when you just go to 3D printer? 
because that's where an asset like that should be located. Okay, so that's stuff from way before, right there. So we have this template, and the point is you can make all kinds of templates, but it's all useless unless you get enough of a group understanding and management in there to make it work. Because I mean, for example, we have this already, but it requires that people understand this whole process, and that's why you know with the fellows and people who are continuing at a deeper level, the development team, you learn more and more about that. So the critical things would be, for example, like the collaborative literacy webinar, uh, reading through the development template page, um, the crash course, because there's like if everyone understands the taxonomy, then in principle, you can get many, many people putting things, and not just randomly. Like if they're random, you can still search the things, look at recent changes, and someone can actually manage and organize that. But if a person actually knows the understands the taxonomy of development, then you can really cause some damage in progress. Now the main page for that that we use right now is the template, the development template. There's so many different things. So you've got the development template, and you've got each project. So you got 50 machines. So I mean, this is complex. This is really complex. You got 50 machines. So you get 12 modules for each. Uh, first of all, you definitely want a development template for each machine. But if a thing is so complicated like the extruder, you probably want to dedicate a development template for just the extruder and other parts. The frame. There's 100 ways to do the frame, variations, there's CAD files, there's structural testing, there's PVC, there's all it. Each thing can get its own development template, and then it gets broken down further into all the development steps. So, so there's a lot of mass that you, you need to do. Now, here's a big point why, and this is, I kind of came up with it last week, as far as formulating, like all the time people ask us, well, why don't you just use GitHub? Right? We already got it, done. And I say, okay, my, my one, one line statement to that, of the 10% of the content that we generate that's handleable, handleable by GitHub, um, GitHub won't handle it because every single build is a fork. That's not a trivial statement. That's, that's a ver actually a very insightful statement that says every time this is different than software. With software, you have an absolute uniform compiler. Right? So you have a piece of, another piece of software that compiles your code and you run it. A million people around the world are going to use that compiler and they're going to get the same result. Those million people in hardware are each going to get a different result. They used different sourcing, they might have used different tools, they might have um, made a change because they didn't have something. In other words, the compiler, what is the compiler? The compiler is the thing that builds it. It's your workshop. It's your skill set. It's what you had for breakfast that day. It's like all these different things that go into that that make the product non-uniform. And in order for somebody to replicate it exactly, you would have to follow, like say someone in India makes the 3D printer. You're going to have all the specific steps you did that, tools, um, whatever. There's a, you know, the development template has a lot of different elements. If you have one of them missing, like for example, like you have a sourcing of some some weird part, I'm in America, and it's like, I don't know, what, I have no idea what that is. They know it all there because they got their culture and way of doing things, their sourcing, whatever. Um, the point is that in, in hardware, you have to keep track of, of all of that information, and therefore if you'd simply, if you treated it like GitHub, and this is a longer discussion, but if you treat it like GitHub, GitHub could simply not have enough memory. The CAD files are large, and you cannot just take, okay, I'm gonna, like in, in my project, I just did that one or two things differently. You cannot say, oh, you know, to my project, I'm just gonna like put those things on a wiki, and that's documentation for that project. Well in order for somebody to replicate it, you don't want them to search like, oh, well, there's that whole lot of other knowledge I need to put into there. You need to copy that as a whole package so it's seamless for somebody else to replicate it. For which reason, every single build, you have to have the big thing embodied for, a whole, for every single build, and you just run out of memory. So, and why do I say for the 10% that GitHub can handle? 
Well, because there's way better tools than GitHub to handle other things. Like, for example, if you go through the development template, um, we can go through each step and say, okay, where does GitHub become really useful because of its functionality versus other places where it's like a wiki is much better or a Google Doc is much better or something else is much better or, or, or GitHub just doesn't have that functionality like to render things. Like you can't render FreeCAD. It can render, you know, say SDLs, but we need to look at FreeCAD. So uh, within the platform. So for example, in the wiki, we might have an embed of the FreeCAD that's doable, but okay. But we can go through this, where is, where is GitHub useful? Well, obviously for software, but for 3D CAD, no, you probably want to have a different platform and a different way to do that. Um, if you have a CAD file, you make one little change. There's no way to diff it, really. Like, you have to store, if you want to keep the old version, you have to keep the entire file, uh, unless GitHub develops that kind of function. So, so the point is, um, like, build instructions, well, that's definitely doable well in the wiki or maybe our Google Docs. Um, build pictures and video. I mean, that's YouTube. Whatever. So the point is, about 10% of these items can be handled well by GitHub, but the rest, because we have so many different things that are non-software related, they're better done elsewhere. So that's why I say, first of all, GitHub can handle 10%, and of the 10% that it can handle, uh, it crashes on you. You can't really use it because every single project is going to be a fork. So that's, that's the answer. And that's a longer discussion, and that's something we have to resolve. But the idea is you use multiple tools, and you have to have enough understanding about this. So you use wikis, cloud editable docs, and freak as some of our main stuff. And otherwise, it's a complex process. There's no easy answer. So does that kind of answer it? Yeah, I think um, yeah. we're going to do a lot. Of so I, I got into the, that's what I wanted to say about GitHub. Um, because there's other people like, uh, what's it called, the, the latest thing we got there so the, from, from Jose? What was, no, you weren't in on that. But latest meetings we were, yeah, was the thing that, they created some other thing that's based on GitHub that's supposedly for open hardware development. And yes, it can help, but you know, you need a little more than that. There's no universal silver bullet here to make it happen. So, so any other questions besides this? Or? That's that's a mouthful on this, but yeah, it's it's a complicated process. It's it's not easy. We're you know I think we're paving some of the way. There's the sad thing. There is no other dedicated open hardware development project. There's many projects that do, just do like one thing, uh, but nobody's trying to look at it as okay. What is a scalable platform? And any comp what's the end game? Any company, any individual, all over the world, anywhere can tap part libraries, designs, and produce them locally. So who does that? Nobody. Uh, a company, of course, has its own proprietary products. That's especially true in, a, in the latest and greatest, which is like the semiconductor industry. Open source is far from happening there in terms of open source chips. So for example, even if you have the open source so-called, well, open source Arduino uh, microcontroller, that chip is not open source. You know, it's, it's done by a proprietary process and the, and the design of it is even closed. You can't get the reference design for the actual microchip that's on the Arduino. So, point is, nobody does this. This is our next, I think, cultural leap as a society so that everybody can benefit. Uh, we, we have evidence from software that this is more effective for very complex things. And I think that as things get more complex and we care more about integration of different elements in society or making a sound environment for people and nature and everything else, we have to think more broadly and become more open because we simply cannot handle all the information that's required. Uh, so I think the trend is towards more open source in general. I do believe culture is evolving to that though slowly and we're trying to push that process. Yeah, yeah. okay. So no further questions. Thank you very much.